afternoon and welcome to another Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation's Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I am your host of the day, Michael Cronodo, and I am delighted. I am so excited because we have none other than today's educators, Professor Brandon Robertson. And you know what? His topic today is what I love about Percy Heath. Now, I know you guys know who Percy Heath is. If you don't, but you're about to learn today about the greatest of the greatest. Uh, but before we even go there, I want to remind you, if you're joining us here live, there's a little feature there. It's called chat. You can uh, type your question or comment in there. We would love to hear from you. Um, so we love uh, interaction here because uh, we're all about learning and all about educating here. So um, without our great sponsors, we could not do what we do. So I want to remind you, please be sure to check out Studio Archives of our past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com's education outreach section. And that's brought to you by Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Partners and Duke Energy, as well as our Young Lines podcast available wherever you stream. And that's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. Just search Young Lines Jazz Master Virtual Sessions wherever you stream. I mean, where can I start here? Uh, Brandon Robinson has brought us these amazing sessions. I'm just going to name a few. You can always go back and check them out. They are in the archives. How about playing duo performances or knowing your worth, negotiating the gig? He's a great person for that because every time I go on social media, Brandon Robertson has a gig somewhere. So I know he gave us some great information for that, as well as some of our What I Love About series. If you don't know him, Brandon Robertson is an Emmy-nominated music director, professional upright electric bassist, composer, and music educator, originally from none other than Tampa, Florida. He has his bachelor's in arts and music from Florida State University in 09 and a master's in jazz studies in spring 2016. And you probably see him down there in Fort Myers at Florida Gulf Coast University, where he is the jazz ensemble director, director of jazz. Uh, also, he's a basketball band director as well. They keep him busy down there in Fort Myers. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the man with the plan, none other than the professor. Professor, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for those who are watching this particular session under the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation. And again, you can go to the studio archives to watch any previous and past um, sessions that have occurred not only for myself um, Alejandro Arenas has also done something um, with the, what I love about series Tyler Wardman has done some things with the what I love about series John O'Leary has done some things with the what I love about series so there's a few of us who have different um, different different musicians that we've covered under under the umbrella of our instruments so please go to the studio and check that out so for today man i get to talk about somebody who is not only to me he's not an overlooked basis he's not a underrated basis he's also not an overrated basis but he's one of them bass players that you strive to become, especially in your later years in life. He had a career that spanned over 55 years. Originally got his break when he moved to New York and he started playing with Dizzy Gillespie and Red Rodney down at the five spot. And from there, when Dizzy created his all-star band that had a lot of earlier members of what was soon to become the modern jazz quartet, this gentleman hails from the great city of Philadelphia, where his roots were planted and firm, and he got to study and perform with some of the locals and the jazz grace that came out of the, the, the city of brotherly love. And um, he's a gentleman that 
was super pioneered and through composed performances and taking the bass and 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 expressing the the, the double bass as a platform that can embellish other styles and at once all in one and i'm talking about the wonderful the talented and the swinger mr percy heat everybody percy heat percy heat percy heat all right so let's get into it so percy heat he was born on april 30th 1923 in wilmington north carolina so he is a southern boy he's from the south everyone um he did come from a musical family his father uh played clarinet his mother sang in church so percy and his brothers all had a very uh established uh background um his brothers who are also jazz legends themselves jimmy heath who played saxophone and albert tootie heath who played drum set and you know the the heath brothers were were highly recognized in the jazz world but when they were growing up you know they were always surrounded by music specifically the music of the african-american culture that's that was traditionally uh performed and sung in church and so right around the time when he was eight uh he picked up the violin and he started learning also the clarinet and then he began to learn the cello he actually became really great at it and he still played cello after he started doing jazz and after he became a, a professional bassist, he still performed very highly and, and uh, widely on the cello. But um, he also served as a Tuskegee Airman in 1944 in the army during World War II. And um, he didn't he didn't see any combat per se, but he, he did serve and, and, and was drafted and enlisted. Um, but when he got out of the army, he soon came back to Philly. You know, he was in a place where um, he then enrolled. If you see at the very bottom here, this PowerPoint, he enrolled and picked up the double bass at the uh, Granoff School of Music in Philadelphia, where he ended up studying um, classical bass. And he didn't necessarily pick up jazz bass until he moved to New York. So a lot of people didn't know that Percy Heath was classically trained. He wasn't just somebody who came off right off the bat started playing jazz music that wasn't the case um he had impeccable technique um very infectious in uh, tuning you know he played in tune very well probably from his studies when he was learning violin and cello but when he switched to double bass um there was an interview that he did many 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 years ago where he talked about how the sound of the double bass just emulated so closely to um to, to 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 the sounds that he would remember his grandparents you know his grandfather specifically just this deep tone that that resonated and every time he felt the note come out of the bass he he would have these flashbacks so i mean the bass he has a spiritual deeply rooted connection with the bass um he recorded extensively in 1950s 60s 70s and, and and pretty much from the 50s through the 90s that was like the bulk i mean the high bulk but i would say the peak of his career was through the 60s and 70s um that's when he really took it up a notch um he recorded 37 albums with the modern jazz quartet um starting all the way from as early as 1952 up until around 1992 93 ish so um, i want to say the the span of his entire career was spent with the modern jazz quartet um he did record and tour with the modern jazz quartet mjq uh miles davis dizzy gillespie he played in dizzy's all-star band charlie parker west montgomery who also uh was a bandmate of his who uh played on the record with miles davis which we'll get to 
Thelonious uh, Monk, and of course, local uh, saxophonist from Philly himself, Benny Golson. Uh, performed extensively with his brothers, saxophonist Jimmy Heath and drummer Albert Tootie Heath, who they all went by the Heath Brothers, and they did multiple tours, uh, specifically starting out in the mid '70s on. Um, and and they they have a collection. There's a live um, there's a live video that I'm going to show where you know you see the Heath Brothers and and and. You get to see Percy and, and Tootie, you know, play a duet together, just drums and bass. Um, he received an honorary doctorate doctorate uh, of music from Berkeley's College of Music in 1989. So he's Dr. Heath. He would only release one album as a leader in 2003 at the age of 80 years old, entitled A Love Song. Now, let me stop right there for a second. 80 years old this man started playing professionally at the age of 19 so from 19 until 80 he just he was just a side man now you hear all the time when people say oh man if you're a musician it could be too late for you you never know because you know i mean it would to some degree that is true because life isn't always going to be as predictable as it's planned so you just never know when your time is and at the age of 80 he decided to put out a record uh larry gales who was a bassist that i covered a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago who um played and performed regularly with thelonious monk larry gales same deal he put out only one album he put out a record actually uh, a year before he died and um kind of a very similar situation with uh percy he ended up passing away two years after he put this record out on his 82nd birthday and so um this particular album it features him playing cello and peter washington is playing bass and uh albert albert tootie heath is playing drums on this one so um and jen Patton jen, or jer Patton uh, is playing piano but uh this it's a beautiful record i love that record uh i've listened to it a few times and it's just you know even at his age you could tell that he is someone who really understands and really is gratifying of the music itself okay all right so here's some of the things that i love about percy heath um one of the things that i really love about percy heath is his rich beautiful sound i mean he has a very point like boing sound like it's it's very uh distinguished he does not sound like any other bass players in jazz you know all the jazz musicians you listen to their bass playing like you can kind of figure out who they are but if you know Percy Heath plays and plays a certain way where it's very hard to distinguish that and so I appreciate his beautiful sound that he's able to, to uh, produce and, and convey on the bass um, his musicality on the double bass itself now let me let me tell you some things about Percy that's pretty hip about his musicality here uh, one thing that Percy was good at was he was really good at bowing I mean, he, he spent a lot of time with the modern jazz quartet playing a lot of through composed pieces of fugue like uh, Pieces that would require the bow. So he was an excellent uh, bow handler um, He also had a way of whenever he pulled the string Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was choking on that yawn. <laughs> I'm so sorry uh when Percy would pull the string, he would pull the string in a way where you could it would go like this. It would give that. It always had this real fat, like a pH of sound. And he was one of the very few basses that did that. Bass players that came after him that emulated that was Ray Brown, Paul Chambers, Sam Jones. Um, and like 
uh, Ron Carter as well, and these guys that are all named, uh, oh, even Oscar Pettiford before him, including Percy Heath, all of these guys play cello. So it's funny um, that all of these, all of these particular uh, bass players can also play cello. So when you hear them pull the string, you can kind of hear that boom, 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 boom kind of sound. Um, he was also an, a very, an incredible musician on a bandstand. Uh, many interviews from jazz musicians who performed with him that would say that his musicality was just superb, like it, superb. It just was on another level. The way he was able to hear things on the bandstand and hear how musicians move in and out of the charts and hear how, um, you know, the, the, the band can start going one way. He'll take his bass line to a whole nother stratosphere, which they got to go with him. He was very, he was really known for doing that. Um, it really gave him a sense of, uh, of ownership, you know, on the bandstand. Um, his contributions to the modern jazz quartet. I mean, this was probably one of the most famous groups of all time in jazz history, period. Um, this particular group was a combination um, which had uh, consi which, which consisted of pianist John Lewis, who originally played in Dizzy Gillespie's big band, um, Connie, Connie K. Connie K did spend some time working with 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 uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie. He's a, he's a he's a very fine drummer from the Midwest area. Uh, Percy Heath on bass, and then of course St. Louis. Thank you from St. Louis, um, but I know he's from the Midwest. Milt Jackson, Milt Jackson vibraphonist, and this particular group, what they would do is combine classical, blues, jazz. And the, instead of it being in sections, it, it, they made them into suites or preludes. And so, um, um, so the, the, the group itself would write, John Lewis would write these compositions in jazz styles, but it would be very, it would be through composed. So there would, a lot of sections would repeat. It would be a lot of repeating. Instead of having like a repeat bar, you would just play it as written. Like it was if you were reading a classical chart. And so up until this point, everything was It was all of that, which became that but it became a lot more um structured and put together and thought out okay and so his his bass playing mattered because that kind of opened the door and set the trend for young bassists such as doug Watkins and scott lafaro and charlie hayden who would then take these open sounds on the bass and utilize it to transition them into the avant-garde era of the 60s. So his the way he would approach the bass kind of set the tone for how a bass players a decade or two after him would start to shape their bass lines and how they would go about playing bass. Um, his extensive musical influences through each decade after the 50s. So um, what he had to do he had he had a very um what i liked about him is that every decade you know you would hear him adapt and change with the times um he would always you know he played with miles davis he played with sonny rollins he played with um you know the modern jazz quartet paul blay he's played i mean he's played with so, uh horace silver he's played with so many different people who play different types of music so like he's been able to adjust in the music of the 60s during the avant-garde he was able to adjust and play in the fusion and keep the swing feel but funk but play things more funky through the 70s and 80s he was able to transition out of the heavy bebop era into that neoclassical style of the 50s you know with the modern jazz quartet so every decade that um percy heath has participated in he's always had a great attempt he's always made sure that uh you know he kept up with the times and and really and really made a big difference um 
he was he pushed the envelope in terms of his solos and bass lines like i stated before he was very very good at um he was very he was very very good at um playing melodically and i think that was due to his time being in the modern jazz quartet um he had such a big melodic approach that you know um he he his bass lines would almost sound like many many fugues or many songs themselves you know they, like it could be his bass line could be a song within a song um the way he would solo was not traditionally like to, to like eight bars eight bars eight bars sometimes he would solo 10 bars take a break come back in or he would play a lot of over the bar or very sparse, but the time is still happening. So again, he was creating things that were leading to bass players play differently in the in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, his innovative concepts in his approach performing with the modern jazz quartet. So every member of this group had to make a contribution in some facet of form of fashion, you know, with how they how they perceived the music um uh, whether it had been like playing counterpoints or playing ostinatos or hemiolas or playing you know vamps or you know whatever like somebody had to do something that was going to propel the music so it, it again his approach on bass was very um keeping things intact but having a propelled forward motion without it staggering and that's very that was very hard to do during this time period because it wasn't a lot of information being happened because it was all being created in real time um the counterpoint melodies in his bass playing like i said if you listen to, i was trying to find a clip online but there's a clip uh of them playing in belgium in the night in 19 I think 61 62 and they're playing this uh bach fugue like piece that john lewis wrote where it goes uh the bass part while uh uh Connie K on drums going So he's playing time. So this is this was supposed to create like a fugue like sound. Uh, <clears throat> there was there's a famous um jazz flautist who wrote an entire jazz week. Uh his name was Claude Bowling and he wrote the bowling suite which is for jazz flute and piano and he wrote a um a fugue and that fugue was dedicated to none other than i found out later through research john lewis because and if you listen to that particular movement it sounds like something that the modern jazz quartet would play so their concepts and even the counter melodies that Percy Heath would, and by the way, he was improvising this. This wasn't, the parts that he had to make up counter melodies were just chord changes there, not the stuff that John Lewis actually wrote out for him to play. So he's creating these counterpoint melodies going against whatever that's happening. Up until this time frame, nothing like that had existed, you know, so again, the the melodies in his bass playing was very very influential um the influence of the heath brothers i mean my gosh jimmy heath with miles you know tootie heath you know every, playing with everybody man this was sly hampton and you know i mean there's there's so many different musicians that between the three of them they're they're like a walking history book with all the who's who's of who they performed with and one thing with Tootie and Jimmy, both of these guys up until the end, man, you know, they, these guys were performing, um, you know, with with younger musicians and really giving opportunity, especially in New York City, you know, with, with uh, Tootie, you know, just really, uh, really getting to know the, the younger generation under him who's carrying on the music. I know plenty of guys my age who had the opportunity to play with uh 
opportunity than, you know, talk about the stories that he would share about his brothers and, you know, just how jazz and how the music was back then, you know. So the Heath brothers also um, had a big impact on my life and my transition as a jazz musician. And then lastly, his influence in jazz cello. So Oscar Pettiford kind of introduced this this in the in the in the early 50s. And then from there you started seeing guys like Ron Carter, Sam Jones, uh Ray Brown, Paul Chambers, you know, you start seeing these guys who would pop on the scene and would be playing cello. Uh Kitas uh Keith, Keith Bettis, you know, is another bass player who is super underrated and then killing, killing bass player. Uh, but he had such a big influence on, on cello. And, you know, jazz cello is very, uh, it's kind of overlooked. It's, it's kind of a thing to sundown upon. But, you know, if you do it correctly and you know how to play cello pretty well, you can pull it off. So um, that was that's one of my reasons why I wanted to state that on there because he has such a big influence in jazz cello itself, and um, I really appreciate. I just appreciate his his contributions that he's made over time. You know, with uh, with the uh, with the modern jazz quartet. Now let's get to some of the music because we we I want to make sure I can keep in the time frame here. So. Uh, the music so these are some of the albums that I dig and 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 I'll break them down to you because each of them each of these albums have like a historical tie in my life and I can remember um, a love song which was again the only album he ever put out as a leader at the age of 80 in 2003 this again featured uh Peter Washington on bass Tootie Heath and Jerry Patton on pianos um, this particular record he plays cello so he he does play bass on some of the songs but for most he's playing cello and um i i don't know i like this record because it it show it you can hear the maturity like at 80 years old man you still can play like that i mean that's beautiful man and that 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 just shows the kind of love that music has for someone i'm sorry the, the type of love that someone has for music to keep them thriving and youthfully, you know, in in their life from playing. Uh, another one of uh, this is now nah, this next record right here. This record I got introduced to this record when I was in college, um, in undergrad. This is the Modern Jazz Quartet and the Oscar Peterson Trio uh, at the Opera House. This is a dope record because you get to hear uh, Ray and Percy, you know back at it again both of them were bandmates and bass players the bassist in dizzy gillespie's band uh back in the late 40s early 50s before they disbanded and which is what's interesting enough is that ray brown when he was at the jazz at the phil Her harmonic uh you know out in cali they were kind of playing in this kind of style and it featured surprisingly the original rhythm section which would have been him percy uh john lewis and kenny clark well that group ended up disbanding and then uh connie k took over kenny clark and then percy heath replaced ray brown that's how you got the modern jazz quartet so it was like these guys were already the group it's just that they got the bass and drummer switched out later so this particular record man it was nice it's nice to hear them back at it and you know just uh, obviously op is the is the is the oh you know he's the g you know he's the og you know so um musically speaking this record just really hit home for me because there was just so many killing killing songs and arrangements on that record um the modern jazz quartet volume two this was a record that features uh django renhart who uh who was the uh uh guitarist a really, a really big pioneer jazz guitarist and the song that they wrote in dedication to him is super killing it's like a really super killing tune like i never really checked that song out until actually no, and I'm not even gonna cap with y'all. I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna mess with y'all on this one. 
I didn't really, really know that song well until I started doing this project. This what I love about series, and I started listening to that song more. I can't, I can't, I can't help. I've been listening to it every day. It's such an awesome, beautiful, beautiful composition, you know. And and even though uh, the version I have, um, he's not soloing on there, but it's just the arrangement of that song is so killing. Like a lot of times, the solos weren't necessarily solo solos. They were more like what what we call in the classical world condensers. You know, so that's what that was. Um, work song by Nat Adderley. Now, Nat Adderley and the Adderley brothers, you know, the Florida boys, you know what I'm saying? Grand out of Tallahassee. And uh, Nat, Nat don't get his props as he should. You know, he was a phenomenal trumpet player. I mean, the Boogaloo, that soulful sound of the 60s that him and his brother Cannonball was producing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't you can't overshadow that. Can't overshadow that. And this particular record right chill with Bobby Timmons and my man Mr. West Montgomery. West Montgomery played some of the baddest stuff on this record. I mean it that they yeah. Especially the song work song. You know what I'm saying? Um the next record, Bags Groove, this was the very, this, no, yes, it actually was. It was the very first Miles Davis, Miles Davis record I had to transcribe my freshman year in college. And this one had, uh, features two of the members from the Modern Jazz qu uh, Quartet. Um, Milt Jackson is on this record. Uh, Sonny Rollins is also on this record. Um, and also... Um, uh well yeah percy's on his record too but but there's a lot of people on on this record that you know it, this was one of them records that you you know you learned some of those famous iconic recordings that people call it jam sessions and whatnot so that's one of my favorite records uh walking by miles davis is also a killing one too the song walking is killing as well that's a that's a dope blues um Benny Gosen and the Phil uh, uh, Philadelphians, um, I believe, and don't, you probably can quote me on this, but I believe this was Benny Gosen's first record as a leader. Like, this was his first album as a leader. And this features one of his iconic, classic uh, tunes that became a jazz standard called Stable Mates. And um, just all kind of bass playing on this one. Nice bass playing. And then lastly, Gotham City. This record is always overlooked at, man. Oh, one of my good saxophone flicks. Shout out to my boy, Boyce Griffith. Shout out to Boyce. Uh, he put me on this record when I was in grad school. And I had never heard of this record. Because Dex, I feel like there's all these, like, I call, I call them mixtapes of, of jazz. When you got these import records or, you know, these complimation records i'm like ah that's just a mixtape you know because that's what mixtapes are and then so uh i what i assumed this was but this was an actual record that he put out in the 80s in the early 80s and uh man percy playing some stuff on this record man he just he you could, you could tell he just went in the booth and was like yeah let's get it yeah, we yeah yeah we about to we about to go ham on it right now. So, this is one. Of, these are some of my favorite features in, uh, on albums that Percy's on. And um, now, let's get to something that I like to feature it called, and this is uh his uh my favorite features. So he takes a uh, actual. I meant to put not a bass solo there, but he actually takes a cello a cello solo on the album, on his self-entitled album, A Love Song, and this is his record as a leader. That was in 2003. Uh, I really love the mu the language that he plays on there. It's very, it's very beautiful and sweet. Um, this funny story. All right, I got a funny story for you. So check this. I had uh, my junior year at Florida State in undergrad. Um, I was in a combo that we had a trumpet player who really um, was really into Miles, and he really loved his record bags group. And on the beginning, at the opening of this record, it's just Miles, Sonny, and, and Percy. It's just it's just the horn and, and bass playing, the, or Percy's walking while the horns are playing the melody. Well, this Joker decided on the, on the actual concert. 
on the record, it's like beep 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 boop he will do beep 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 and at that time, I didn't really know how to walk bass lines like that. So, yeah, that was rough. So now, every time I listen to this song, it always takes me back to that moment. <laughs> so, you you guys will listen to it and y'all tell me what you think. Uh, another tune that was killing, too, that kind of had like a church uh, boogaloo blues, rhythm and blues kind of feel was this song called Sack of Wool by... Uh, Nat Adderley off the album Work Song, and the whole entire, the whole entire album kind of has that feel. Uh, but Sack of Woe is a super hip, a super hip tune because when it gets to the bridge part of it, the tuba doo 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 beep boo bop, um zip it it bop bop bop, yeah yeah yeah. Now the Django, that's on the Modern Jazz Quartet Volume Two, killing, 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 killing. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm leaving it at that. And then this is a live, uh, this is a live feature on the um, at Bur at the Bern Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Um, this is him playing a bass solo over uh, Morgan Lewis, uh, Nancy, uh, yeah, Morgan Lewis and um, Nancy. Oh, I can't forget the last name. But they wrote uh, "How High the Moon." Okay, so let's go ahead and listen to some of these and uh, you guys tell me what you think. We're going to start with a love song, which is this cello feature, uh, him playing solo uh, cello, playing a solo on cello. And uh, this features Percy Heath, Peter Washington, Jeb, yeah, Jeb Patton. That's what I'll say, Jared. Jeb Patton on piano and Albert Tudy Heath. So let's check this out. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
tell you guys something, man. You know, the 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 tone, the clarity, the 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 feel. You know, everything is all featured right there without me having to explain any of that. You know, um, just him taking his time. You know, the the not rushing, the beautiness. You know. That's that's what I really liked about this particular solo. Um, I remember when I first listened to this album, that was the first thing that stuck out was this this little bit, this little solo that he did by himself, and I was like, wow, it's just you just giving you you you're giving me a different perspective of how I can approach the the bass itself with that same mindset. Okay, all right, well, this next one, this next one right here, this next one right here. Okay, so this one is a funny one. Um, like I told you the story about what happened to me in, in undergrads, but uh, Bags Groove is one of Miles Davis' most prestige and highly uh, prestige. You liked what I did there. Um, highly recognizable albums of uh, Sonny Rollins, Monk, Horace Silver, Milt Jackson, uh, Kenny Clark, and Percy Heath. Okay, you got three of the original members of the modern jazz quartet. And he and then he plays a lot of cool stuff on him, man. There's a lot of good music on here. <clears throat> but this one is uh Oleo. And it just swings really hard, man. I just like the way they play on this one. And I just like the way that Percy Heath just lays it down. Like he just lays it down the whole time. <laughs> pause it right there because as you heard the, during the entire solos it was just bass and drums and you hear you can hear the consistency that uh ph had man i mean he had he had a fat tone 
you know, his baselines had some good motions, great motions. Uh, he even played some counterpoints that went against what Miles and Sonny did, you know, and he played so clear that the piano was like, listen, personally, I don't really need to be playing right now. I can chillax. I don't got to do nothing. So this is one of my favorite records and just in general because Percy plays like this on the entire record. And, and you're not going to get a better sound than that. All right. Let's move on to Nat Adderley and Sack of Woe. This song right here hit, man. Still hits to this day. Still still bump. Um, this particular song is off of the album um, uh, Not Bad's Groove, a work song. Excuse me, my fault on that one, everyone. Uh, this is a Waffle work song, not Bags Groove work song. That was a typo. So I just want to make sure I clarify that. Um, Nat Adderley, Wes Montgomery, Bobby Timmons. Bobby Timmons, everyone, from the, who played with the Messengers. Uh, Keter Betts, man, he's one of the baddest bass players, man. He's super underrated, man. This cat always get overlooked. And he wanted them, he'd be playing them banger thangers, man. Like, all of that stuff. Um, and Lewis Hayes, of course, on drums, you know, hold it down. So this is uh, Nat Adderley, you know, one half of the Adderley brothers. And this is his tune. Sack of woe. Doom, doom, ga tick ga doom, ga tick ga doom, ga doom, ga tick ga doom. I hear him play under Montgomery. Now y'all know that thing, right? So I told you, boy, they playing that thing, a thing. But man, listening to P P H and um, man, listening to these cats, man, go at it. Listen, listen, man, listen, listen to them cats play behind each other was so killing. And and watching him play with Montgomery is always a treat. Okay, so this next one here, um, the Modern Jazz Quartet. And this is a tune they wrote called Django. Beautiful composition. 
I'm not gonna say any further. I'm just let you check it out. You tell me what you think. reason why i really like that tone is because of the the odd meter changes so the a section is is, is six is measures of six it's the six bar phrase and then the bridge is an eight bar phrase but then the last eight or i should say c i call it a c section is 12. so even though the a's would be technically 12 they're they're phrased in bars of six and it doesn't reside, it just, it just keeps going. So that's what I mean by having that through composed sound that it doesn't repeat, it just keeps going. So it might sound like it's repeating, but they're actually just playing the song straight through, right? But this particular tune, when I first heard that, I was like, oh my God, this is so killer. And just, just his, just his bass lines, man, you got some really cool bass lines on there as well. All right, and then lastly, um, Lastly, I want to just play this nice clip that I found of of the Heath brothers playing How High the Moon. And this is a, a bass solo feature that features him and Tootie. And this is it, uh, I believe in the mid 80s in Bern, Switzerland at the uh, Bern uh, Jazz Festival. <laughs>
Final thoughts. Percy Heath has inspired an entire generation of highly motivated forward thinking bass players. One of the pioneers of the cool bop, hard bop, and beyond. One of the very few basses to perform for more than a 30 year period. A major contribution to the classical blues and jazz here in America. And of course, his originality because he's always original. And this is why everybody for today, this is why I love. Percy Heath. Beautiful, beautiful job today, Professor Rand Robson. I mean, this is what I love about series. I think it may be one of my favorites. Uh, I, I learned a great deal from you today. And Thank you. one thing I did learn, you know, it's never too late to release an album. I mean, you say he was in his 80s. 80 years was, old, man. A, yeah. a side man for so many years, but he still yeah. managed yeah. to, you know, bless us with his own project. Yeah. That is awesome. So much history, so many great nuggets that you left us with today uh, in this presentation. And I want to remind everyone, um, maybe you have a future uh, topic you like us to suggest or an artist you've never heard us uh, cover. Uh, mm -hmm. We love hearing from our listeners or you may be want to just tell us how much you enjoy Professor uh, Robertson's presentation. We would love to hear your feedback on that, too. You can always email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com, um, and we would love to hear back from you. And don't forget, check out the archives. If you missed this live, you can always go back, rewind, take notes, and share mm -hmm. with others. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Professor, for thank your great you. work. I'm your guest host, Michael Cronodal. And until next time, everybody, keep it swinging. Have a keep good day. Swinging. Have a good one, guys. Bye.